Right, colleagues, good morning again. So let's start now. So we uh, yesterday did quite a lot. We considered uh, sort of, or we uh, looked at introduction to modeling uh, to understand main principles of modeling. So you will not be able to build models yet, but at least you know what to have in mind uh, when you are doing this. This is perhaps, uh, I see on YouTube only part of my body is seen, and it's not the head. Ah, okay, okay, sorry, sorry, good. So, um, as we discussed, hydroinformatics has a number of uh, important areas which are not necessarily attended by civil engineers or managers in their everyday practice. And one of these areas is uh, optimization. So, optimization is a uh, general technology which can be used in any area of uh, science, engineering, social life, and so on and so on. So I will introduce these principles uh, to you today. So please find presentation which is called in presentation introduction to optimization basics, I think. Have I, I send it to you, right? Do I have this file? Okay. Hmm? Sorry? Uh, I'm not sure now. Uh, do you have it? Yes, you have it. Okay, good. So, um, I excluded one part from it because it's quite a uh, long course on optimization. But if we have time, we may return to other aspects in the end of the uh, course if we have time. So, some of the optimization problems in water resources you see listed here, and it's only some of them. So there are more problems that would require you uh, to apply or at least to think in optimization terms. For example, multipurpose reservoirs. So what should be the releases ensuring maximum satisfaction of the users? And there are many different users. Typical optimization problem. Resource allocation. How much water should every user get, depending on their needs, and so on and so on. Models calibration, as we discussed, it's an optimization problem. We're minimizing error. Urban drainage networks optimization. What pipes should you use or rehabilitate or design uh, to put into the system to ensure that your flood damage is minimum and costs are also minimum? And so on and so on. So you would, uh, whatever you take, there would be always a component where you should think in terms of minimizing or maximizing something. So, optimization comes from uh, Greek language. It means actually maximization. Optimum is maximum, actually. But in optimization, we also solve minimization problem. Still, we call it optimization. So, for a single criterion, a single objective uh, optimization problem, we would have only one function that we want to minimize. So, we'll deal in this course with the case when uh, function is real valued and uh, parameters on which it depends, x1, xn, are also real values. So everything real values. You could think of also other uh, possibilities to pose this problem, but uh, we'll stay in this course with this one. These uh, variables can be binary, for example, also could be 0, 1, for example, if you include the pump or not include the pump into the water distribution system, it would be then binary. Uh, but for the time being, let's think of uh, real values. So this <laughs> uh, set of real values is called a vector. Do you know this notion of a vector? It's a basic in mathematics, but some people say, oh, we don't remember what it is. So vector, it doesn't mean it's an arrow, but it's a set of uh, real values n in this case, so we say this vector x, x capital then, in n-dimensional space. Okay. Now, multi-objective optimization problem is a bit more difficult. It's posed in a, it's an ill-posed problem actually. We want to minimize several functions, m of them, to minimize 
uh, these m functions, you would need uh, also to find x1, xn, which the vector, which would bring function value to the minimum. But look, this vector here and here, it's all the same vector. So it may happen it brings this function to a minimum, but not this one, if they're conflicting. So you have to find the compromise. So this problem actually cannot be solved. You cannot have one vector in most cases. You cannot have one vector that would minimize several functions. That's a problem with multi-objective optimization problem, but we'll discuss it later. So if we uh, want to pose maximization problem, then we just put minus sign in front of f, and we'll be maximizing then minus f instead of minimizing f. So, for the, so it's no problem to switch. So for the time being, we'll be talking about minimization of the function. So example again could be that this x1, xn uh, releases from the reservoir through the uh, turbines to generate electrical power. In, so, and you want to choose these releases, and this is in time, so it's today, tomorrow, and so on and so on, for several days or months or for the whole year. Uh, you want to find releases that would, for example, maximize amount of hydropower generated. Why you cannot say, oh, release w water as much as possible uh, every day, and then you generate maximum power? Yes, true, but you will run out of water soon, so reservoir would be empty. So problem is not that trivial, so you would have some constraints on these releases. You cannot release more than a certain amount. Sometimes you cannot re release less than a certain amount because you need ecological flow in the river downstream. So there are also constraints around this problem, so it's not uh, uh, that easy to pose this problem. So what is an optimization problem? If you think that you want to maximize something or minimize, you have to think of three things. First, objective function. What exactly you want to minimize or maximize? Second, decision variables. These are the variables you would choose uh, values for so that this vector chosen would bring minimum to your objective function. Okay. And then the third component, constraints. These are ranges for these variables, which you don't want to uh, violate. Or perhaps there would be some functions that you will write down, which would link these variables uh, together. So for example, if you don't want that releases in the reservoir differ too much from day to day, you would impose constraint on these releases x1, x2, x3, and so on, such that difference between subsequent releases would not be too high. It's a constraint. So you cannot choose a vector 10, 100, 0, 10, 100. There would be too much difference. So you would, would not accept this solution because it violates constraints. Again, three components. Objective function, decision variables, constraints. Sometimes decision variables are called independent variables because we can choose them, so they don't depend on anything. So if you think of water resources planning, then it's also an optimization problem. So we first indeed have to identify, quantify objective functions. So in water resources management, what could be objective functions? Could you think of uh, other objective functions that we... So reservoirs aside, you know it. Think of any water management problem. Why do we do management? To achieve what? It's a question. Wake up. I'm jet lagged, so I could go to sleep at a certain moment. So then wake me up. So water resources management problem. Think of any problem related to water management. Water supply. And what is the objective function of water supply? So, for example, one billion cubic kilometers of water. That would be maximum. So 
Sorry again? Yes. Okay, but yes, very right. So very right. We want to maximize uh, supply, but uh, in the end, users don't need as much water as this system could deliver. So think of how to formulate your problem. What do you want to achieve? What do users want? What is it exactly? It's not maximum of supply. Okay, you are talking about decision variables. I'm asking about the objective function. So let's go back. What do we want to minimize or maximize? It's not the dam you're maximizing. No, dam is for you a device that would supply water. Okay, what problems? What problems? Leakage is not your final objective. No. L your final objective is human who drinks this water. That's your final objective. Leakage indeed is a problem. You can pose it as the second objective function, you want to minimize leakage, but often you don't have control over leakage. It just happens. You want to repair this and all this, but it's not your final objective. Your final objective, actually, final objective of this company that supplies water is to maximize profit in the end. But if we think honest company that don't think of profits, they think of people, okay? So what is this that you want to maximize now? Of people. Forget about reservoir. We talk about the final. You, you see how, how difficult it is to formulate op uh, optimization problem. That's what I meant. It's not that uh, in universities uh, you are taught and many other people around the world to think of these terms, but you have to. So let's re return back to humans. So it's sort of level of happiness, isn't it? You want to maximize, right? So when are these cons consumers of water happy? When is it? in terms of now engineering systems, in terms of water supply. Oh, exactly. So these users have water demand every hour or every day, whatever. And they want this water demand to be satisfied. That's level of satisfaction. That's what they want to maximize. In other words, want to minimize the difference between uh, the water supply and water demand. So that every time you open the tap, you have the water. That's the final objective for you. And water should be, of course, clean, right? And all this stuff, additional things on water quality. You can think of many things. This is your final objective. So what are then the decision variables here for this case? What should you choose optimally looking at pipes, reservoirs, as you correctly stated, dams, whatever? so that users are satisfied. What are these decision variables you have to look at? Right, so for example, choosing diameter of pipes or quality of pipes, material, all these are in design. So when you design the system, all these variables you have to take into account. There are many design variables in the system so that you design it well. Now, supply. You have to get water somewhere. If you get it from a river or from uh, groundwater, you have to ensure that supply is enough. That's maybe where you start, right? If you don't have supply of water, you can build pipes, but they will be empty. So you could think of this. Reservoirs is correctly stated. You should look at the reservoir, so if you take water out of the reservoir, there is also enough water for hydropower, don't forget. So problem becomes multifaceted. Water supply is a complex problem. If you pump out groundwater, then you have su subsidence of soil, which happens in many cities, uh, by the way. Large cities grow, and they talk about sea level rise. Uh, Jakarta, for example. They say, let's build a dam, because sea is rising. It's not sea is rising, it's your Jakarta is falling. 
because you're pumping too much water for industry and, and uh, power in uh, water supply. So stop pumping and you will stabilize. Of course, she is uh, rising, but slowly, but uh, subsidence subs uh, is uh, fast. And in many other places, the same thing. Old temples crack in some countries. Why? They were standing there for 1,000 years. Now you see huge cracks. Well, because there is a subsidence of soil. Groundwater explo exploitation is extremely high. That's a big problem around the world. Anyway, returning back to this. So decision variables, indeed, many decision variables. So if you want to have an optimum design, so optimal design for you is the one that would maximize uh, user satisfaction here so that it would ensure, for example, if you measure also satisfaction, you could look at the head at each point, and head should be, say, six uh, atmosphere pressure, right? Or five or three. Huh? Ten? Okay. In Brazil, it's ten. In some other countries, if you have 1.1, you're already happy, you know. So, <laughs> so. Well, I'm not sure. It's everywhere. So it's ten maybe for high-rise buildings. Then you need indeed uh, high pressure. But for for water supply in uh, houses on the first level, I don't know. So anyway, that that's what you think of. What are the constraints? What are constraints when you, for example, design water distribution system? Constraints means what are your limitations? Constraints on decision variables. Right, that's a constraint. So yes, indeed. So water supply into the system is limited. Maybe that's a constraint. Yes, what else? In terms of engineering design of the system, do we have constraints in building up this system? The yes, that's similar to this, so reservoirs. So it's a supply to the system, but the system itself, pipes, do have constraints? So constraints are on, on de design, uh, design decisions that you make. So there are some constraints uh, on cost. You can uh, select, don't forget costs, of course, the major constraint. But if we consider only satisfaction, we may not consider cost yet. But even then, you have uh, technical constraints. For example, if you want to put a new component of water distribution system, there could be a lot of roads you have to dig. That's important constraints. When you rehabilitate water distribution systems, pipes are underground, so to reach them, it's a cost for the city because you stop traffic at certain places. Okay? So there are a number of constraints that you should think of. So that's, you see how it's not easy to pose optimization problem. But it's important to do. So if we go... Yes, yes. Engineering judgment. So experienced people know it. Those who design systems, of course, know all this stuff. Okay? Uh, with experience, you would understand what variables are important. But even with, before that, you use your common sense. You, you start somewhere. Like we discussed now here, in five minutes, we could already advance considerably uh, with this. But look, without knowledge of the technical system, you cannot optimize it, of course. You, you should first have the knowledge, uh, judgment, and ask consultants uh, to help and all this. But consultants should not come to you and say, look, we would implement the system for you, it would cost that much. Not good, because th they may implement system that you don't need. It could be either over-engineered, so it would supply too much that you don't need, then it means it would cost more. That's maybe their wish, first wish. Or they say, oh, we did this for a neighboring city, we, we implement the same solution for you, it works there, it will work here. But you say, okay, let's look at uh, user satisfaction level there, at the heads at each point. Let's look at the models. What do they say? Let's maximize user satisfaction. So you pose optimization problem for these consultants, and then they should come up with solutions that would allow you to judge. So your quality of the system is measured here. You should look at the technical performance of this system and judge if it's good or not. And you try to maximize technical performance, but in the end, you have to look at customers. Final user, that's where the truth is. All right, so returning back to planning. So the planning is a bit 
thing like also optimization. I just want to say that the word planning also means optimization. So you always, when you make a plan, you have to think why do I make this plan? What do I want to achieve when the plan is implemented? What exactly you want to achieve? Often plans are made based on historical judgment or whatever without clear objective uh, uh, in front of you. Not a good plan, of course. Why? Because you cannot assess if plan is implemented. Decision variables and constraints, we discuss it. Of course, you collect data. So collect data means also ask data from advisors, from engineers, from users, future users, what do they want. You have to check what exactly the city wants in terms of if you talk about water uh, supply. If you uh, talk about building a dam, for example, when you build a dam, how high should be the dam? That's your one of the important decisions. It means it would have implications on costs and many other things. How high? How would you determine the height of the dam? If you think of to make a reservoir and then to generate electrical power. Give me one idea. How high should be the dam? Not exactly, approximately. Let's make one step. Look, you have a river that flows. Do you need the, to know the flow of the river? Now look, you block the river now with the dam. Okay, In five years, there would be a dam. If you assume the same flow, you should realize that if it, it, you never open releases from this dam, it should hold all this water, right? So you look at DM and you simply solve simple algebraic problem to un un understand, so for example, during a year, how much water you have to keep. So them should be at least that high. Not at least, but it's a maximum, actually, because you always release water. So releasing water, you create a balance. But this reservoir, uh, geometrically, should fit the dam, of course. So that's simple answer. Easiest. Of course, there are many other things to consider, but that's the simplest, isn't it? When you design a dam, if you, uh, if you're, you know, small kid and you're building dams, when you have streams, do we have snow here? I remember when I was a kid, would have snow melt, and streets would be full of water, you know, streams of nice water. So you build a dam and create an obstacle for other pedestrians, and you great fun, you know, people cannot cross, you know. So then uh, that's how I started to learn uh, the water resources planning, you know. <laughs> no, of course, we're not that bad, so we would then, yeah. Right, so uh, you have to uh, collect data. So in this case, data is data about the snow melt and the flow, all this data which would tell you how much water you would have uh, at that point. Generate alternatives. Alternatives here, these alternatives, are different vectors of decision variables. This is an alternative. So for example, uh, if you're solving water distribution problem, you would uh, generate different alternative designs, and design is characterized by diameters of all the pipes, for example, in the system, plus the design itself, and so on. How many pumps you need, how many valves, location of the reservoir, and all this stuff. And then another design and third design. You would have many designs that you will have to evaluate. And when you evaluate these designs, you will have to calculate objective function for each of them, this objective function. So every design you evaluate with respect to satisfaction of the users that would drink your water, right? And costs, of course, and many other things. But for the time being, we look only at one objective. But there are many objectives. Then what do you do? You select the preferred alternative. That's it. Your decision making is made. Decision is made. And then you implement and that's your best design because you evaluated it would be best design. In reality, maybe it's not the best design, but you try to use all the data you have and to make the best possible judgment when you evaluate alternatives. And that's engineering design which was put into practice. And this is all process of optimization. So generation of alternative is a tricky thing. So we'll discuss uh, later how to do it. 
uh, sometimes there are only two alternatives considered. Uh, imagine an engineering company wants to sell you a certain design. They would tell, okay, I have two designs or three designs for you to choose from. And you read this and you see clearly design number one uh, is really bad. Design number two is very good but extremely expensive. And design number three seems okay. So you choose out of three designs number three and it was deliberately done for you because it's easy to kick out first two designs because of you know, obvious reasons. And that's how your, the company is trying to push you the design they want you to sell. And that's dangerous because they say, look, we gave you three alternatives, so we're honest with you. There are three possibilities, but in fact, there are many more possibilities. So you have to generate many more alternatives of different kinds and do so spend much more time here than uh, here. Because this would be easy when you have a good choice of alternatives. Any questions so far? Good. Classical optimization. So now let's uh, solve a simple problem. I'm telling you that objective function for you is x minus 15. We have only one variable, x, real valued. Function is x minus 15 squared. That's the function. So what do I do? I could use graphical method of solving it. I plot this function here, and I choose the solution. What is the solution of this problem? Sorry? No. Oh, look, don't be embarrassed. Most people say the first answer is zero, but it is not the solution. Solution is 15, and value of the objective function that corresponds to this solution is zero. Okay, so let's try to use terminology. I always ask this provocative question, and typically you hear zero is the solution. But solution is 15, okay? So how do we find this solution? Well, graphically you can see it, you say it's obvious, but imagine you have many variables and all this. So in fact, Look, if we draw derivative here, derivative at the minimum is zero of this function. So it's a classical way to solve this problem. You find derivative of this function. It's two by x minus 15. So solution here is obvious is 15. You put star here, meaning that it's optimal solution. Okay? So that's simple case. And actually, this figure shows how most of optimization problems are solved. If you have problems of calculating this function, you try to generate different solutions here, say 20, 17, and all this, and look at the value of the function. And if you feel you're approaching the minimum here, your objective function would go down, 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 and it means you look at derivative, actually, because with every step you would get lower values, so it means you're going down. Or some people say, let's take a heavy ball and throw it here at this point, and it will roll right like this, and if there is a friction, it would move like this, like this, approaching the minimum. It's gravitational method, or it was developed in the 70s in Ukraine, in Kiev, and it was called method of the heavy ball for complex functions. Interesting, and it, it seems to work. At that time, there were no powerful computers, so that physical analogy helped uh, to understand how it works. So... Uh, if uh, you have function of multiple um, decision variables or independent variables, so x bold, you see it means vector, and these vectors belong to the real valued space, then you have to find the point x, vector x, where all partial derivatives would be zero. And this is called the gradient. So vector which is uh, uh, calculated by finding partial derivative at this point, so this becomes a number, so you find analytical partial derivative here, and then you put the current value of x in it, and you get a number. So that becomes a vector in the space of decision variables, and this is a gradient. It points to the, it directs you to the direction of the maximum increase of uh, function f, maximum increase. 
minus gradient points you to the maximum decrease of the function. So we have to follow minus gradient if we want to find uh, derivative, uh, sorry, the minimum. So most of the methods of classical optimization are based on this idea that we want to uh, aim at gradient which is zero, it means we're at minimum, but when we have the gradient which is not zero, then it will point as a vector to the direction of maximum increase of the function. So look at the title, please. It's called unconstrained optimization. So unconstrained optimization means we don't have constraints, uh, constraints uh, on uh, decision variables. But let's now introduce constraints. So let's introduce constraint that x, your decision in, in single dimensional case, in this function, x minus 15, um, uh, should be between 5 and, uh, and 25. Does it change anything? No, because these constraints happen to be uh, conveniently located. So still, when you find derivative of this function, it would be 15. And thanks God, 15 is between 5 and 25. So it means this constraint is not ah, aqua. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, water management starts. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, yes. Let's optimize. So what I'm op optimizing now, by the way? What do I optimize now but when I take water? Satisfaction. Satisfaction, yes, because I'm thirsty. So Mario was kind enough to see it, so he, he generated alternatives. So what were these alternatives? First, to let Dimitri not drink and die. <laughs> and then lecture is finished. Okay, objective function is not good. He's not satisfied. He's not satisfied. He will go to jail, maybe. You all will be also witnesses. Not good. Another alternative is to go and get water for him. Or oh, objective function, satisfaction is good, audience is happy, Mario is happy, Dimitri is happy, everybody is happy. So that's, well, you solved the optimization problem. And interestingly, yes, your objective function coincided with mine. That's good. So you are happy, you are smiling. I'm happy, I'm smiling. So these two multi-objective optimization, actually, we have two objective functions which do not uh, contradict each other. But often this is not the case. So in society, often members of society try to compete for the limited resource. So if they join as a group, they become stronger. But still, often they're competing, also for in water management. Uh, obrigado. So... Vasha uh, Zdarovia. No. Or Prost. In Dutch, it is Prost. Prost. Yeah. But you don't say it to water. So it should be a bit stronger. Yes. So uh, here, constraint doesn't violate uh, our decision making. Derivative is zero. We're happy. Great. But let's look at this case. It may happen that your constraint is 5 to 10 you try to use the same approach to find optimum. So your solution is 15, but it is not satisfying constraints. So it is not a solution. We said your solution should be between 5 and 10. So derivative is 0 here, it's 15, but your solution should be this interval, a problem. So it's a typical problem in uh, nonlinear optimization when solutions uh, based on finding, uh, uh, using the gradient, are not on, are not in the uh, feasibility region. So they're not accepted. Ideas, what to do here? How to find the solution? So you mean calculate value of the function at the constraints? Okay, so here value is, I don't know, 25. Yes, 20, 10 minus 15, 5, 25. And here value is 100, right? And then? And verify if, the, if there is no uh, point there, if the, the, the derivative is zero. In this case, you can see there is not, but... 
if derivative is zero, then I would use this one. But here, derivative is not zero. Here also is not zero. In the middle. In the middle. Uh, the, they could have a change of the behavior. Could be, mm. yes. But then this method is not applicable. So yes, we, if we have time, we'll consider the method uh, by breaking this interval in, in pieces and then finding solution in the middle, yes. Uh, you're right, we can do it, yes, good, yes. But I would like still to stay with this one. So what is happening is this. We uh, uh, try to start for searching for a, a solution at one of the random points in the middle. Okay? We don't know yet. Look, when you have this graph, it's all easy. You just point and this is the solution. That's easy. But you don't have it. So what you have is function, which could be very complex to calculate. So when you have a function, you don't have any plot. So if you have a plot, it means you can calculate function at every point. So it means not complex function. Then the problem is easy. Problem is complex when you have a complex function, you cannot calculate function at every point. Otherwise, you would have been able to draw this. And, and you can see easily the solution is here. Also, don't forget, this is one dimensional case, so easy to visualize. But uh, often this function has hundreds of decision variables, if not thousands. So it's impossible to visualize. You don't feel what's behavior of the complex function. So what is done, we'll discuss it in a second. I just want to show you on a single, uh, single uh, variable case. So what is done is that we would uh, start so solving this problem uh, at one of the points. Not solving, sorry. We, we take this point and we calculate the function value. Okay? We have it. It would be x0. So then we would calculate gradient at this point, gradient of this function. Okay? So gradient here is simply derivative of this function at this point. Which way this derivative shows? It, uh, so gradient, it shows this way to the direction of the maximum increase of the function. But we should go to the minimum, so we go minus uh, gradients. So we know at this point what would be the direction towards the minimum. Because derivative shows this way. And we make next step in that direction. So it's useful to calculate gradient here, even if it's not zero. Because it shows you direction of the uh, decrease of the function. We make next step. How long is this step? We'll discuss later. We make ne next step. Then we again calculate function here. We calculate derivative. Which direction does it show? Again, that direction, minus gradient. We make next step. And in this way, we'll be approaching, because every time we go downhill, so we'll be approaching the minimum. That's the main idea in most nonlinear optimization cases. Also, they look at second derivative and so on and so on. It's complication. I want you to understand the detail. And in the way, when we walk making these steps here, every time calculating gradient, we'll hit this constraint 10. You cannot move anymore. And you will remember the function values, and you know you reached the minimum possible value. So you stop. That's the main idea of solving this problem. So constraint optimization problem is formulated a bit different. We have f of x uh, to minimum subject to some inequalities of constraints. Often they're formulated as inequalities or equalities. And there are books written how to solve this problem. So if you're interested, search for books on nonlinear optimization. Or for example, the good book is uh, Muller Operations Research. Very nice book, that thick, and, but it, it covers all in very good detail. Uh, also, Lagrange multipliers can be solved when you introduce multipliers to these constraints and you formulate unconstrained optimization problem, also a possibility. But currently, it is not done. It was done in the 70s when we didn't have uh, digital computers uh, with enormous power. You had to work a lot with analytical description of the functions, but this time has passed. Pro problem is that often you do not have analytical description of the function. We'll talk about this in a second. But still, uh, let's uh, work assuming this function is differentiable so that we can find derivative. That's a strong assumption for the time being. 
So uh, for this, iterative schemes were developed to solve this problem by iteration because of constrained character. So we cannot just find gradient and uh, find point where it is zero. The problem is constraints are so complex, it's never zero. But it, sh it shows you the direction of uh, search, and hence we can arrange iterative process stepwise, stepwise. We would move towards the minimum. That's what it has done. And with this beautiful picture, let me finish because we need a break, correct? So the break till 9.30. Coffee? Good. So coffee management. Not water management, but coffee management, yes. Maria Clara is coffee manager. Now we just have water because the coffee didn't arrive yet. So. Yes, for 83rd, but they didn't come until now. Yeah, but we can just drink water now and uh, drink coffee in the second break because we have another one at uh, yeah, after the next lecture. So you see, this uh, tells you that real life problems have a lot of uncertainties. <laughs> yeah. You can formulate all this, draw these nice diagrams, and uh, you think this is your coffee uh, point? No. <laughs> Uncertainty is so high that you move away, away, and you arrive uh, to this. No problem. It's not that bad. So level of satisfaction is slightly lower, but it's a break. Yeah. Anyway, uh, but we're allowed to have break. Yes. So think of uncertainties. But we'll talk about robust optimization later, and this optimization which takes into account uncertainties.